of our Nature Kids community locally and around the world. I'm Tanil Christensen. And I'm Samantha Jurgens. And we've got Ashaya Sneddon joining us today as our change maker. She is a pretty awesome homesteader. She has she is the creator of Eco Yoga and she's an educator of sustainability with uh, a range of different organizations. So she's going to share so much in this interview. But what we're really why we wanted to interview um, Ashaya is because she shares the wet tropics with us. She lives here in the beautiful land of Jabakai peoples. She does a lot of work with other Indigenous organ or communities and organizations. And her take on uh, somatic biophysics, I think it is, one. and yeah. <laughs> nature connection is um, is really incredible and groundbreaking, I believe. I'm not sure who else is really doing it, especially here in our community. Mm. So, so much to share. I think let's just jump into it. And Sammy's going to lead the questions away for you. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for Thank being you. here. Thank you, ladies. Mm. Ah, most welcome. And uh, also a beautiful mum too of uh, a yeah, mom yeah. Mom too. So there's a, there's a lot of context in here for us today. That's Absolutely. awesome. So yeah, thanks for joining us. So just Thank straight you. off the bat, can you can you tell us what you get up to? How do you fill your days with work and play? Yeah. So like Toddy was saying and kind of explaining a little bit of things that I do, I live in the wet tropics. I am a wet tropics enthusiast. Um, I work for a company called Small World Journeys, which is an ecotourism based company where we take our students out. Um, it's a real variety of different things that we teach on. We teach on social aspects, we teach on cultural aspects, sustainability, environmental practices. Every day looks really different. It's a really different day that I get up to. It's really exciting and really challenging at the same time. And then I have my eco yoga, which is a passion of mine, which I've been developing for about four years now. It's based around the philosophies that through the movements of our body, through the somatic experience that we're connecting through, we can take this connection of nature and embed it into ourselves. We can learn how to utilize that connection to be able to teach my students how to bring that nature within and how to bring that nature within to the outside. So it's a, it's a developing vision of mine that, um, yeah, it, it's taken some time for me to put all the pieces together, but it's a beautiful way that I can offer into community, really instilling that loving place for us and bring my teachings from my environment into my yoga practice. Mm. And then I work for a really beautiful company here, which these beautiful ladies know about, um, Rare Earth Oils, mm. which is a local essential oil and herbal company. We make our own uh, native oils. So we go out and we harvest around the area some native oils and distill them and create them into our own essential oils and make some beautiful balms that support the body. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful way for me to work. My whole life is surrounded by the practices of nature. I've got the environmental aspect and then I've got the body movement and then I've got the naturopathy in my life. So really grateful for all the opportunities for me to connect to nature on a deeper level and to be able to explore that with people around me. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And that really yeah. sounds like, you know, we, we talk about zoning in permaculture and zone zero zero is our inner self. We have zone zero, which is our house, zone one straight outside. Yeah. So it's really lovely to see somebody in our community and, you know, beyond to be able to extend that um, education of bringing nature within and looking at, yeah. you know, and from a very embodied experience. So, you know, and you have to have walked that path to be able to offer that. So it's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been kind of the infusion my life has taken two really beautiful paths. One, 
has been the environmental work. I've kind of always worked within different environmental jobs and building that career. And then on the other hand, I had my naturopathy and my yoga and I would sit there often. I was like, how do I bring these worlds together? Because it seems so fundamental mm -hmm. to be able to teach from both aspects and to be able to have somebody so present within a yoga practice, mm -hmm. to be able to guide their bodies deeper into these states of being, deeper into the awareness, the sensations, the connections and exploring different themes on how we can utilize that connection to bring it into our life and what that looks like. So this morning we just did a practice. I just finished my yoga teaching and this morning was about using nature and the way that we sit and witness nature as an appreciation and a state of gratitude. And can we explore that in our own state of being in when emotions arise or when thoughts arise or when sensations in the body, can we just sit there and witness it as a state of nature and not applying or attaching the mind like the way that we do in in self-observation we're often really critical but when it comes to just an aspect of a tree or an aspect of a flower we can just witness it we we mm -hmm. don't take it apart we don't need to try and say that it's not perfect or that it, it, it's missing pieces or that it needs to be more we just let it be and exploring these different themes throughout the weeks um and how how we can use nature as that muse for us to go deeper within ourselves Oh, wow amazing yes and so like we have we have um like a monthly mindfulness and yoga and movement um lesson in our program and it's so it's just such an amazing thing for you know essentially it's designed for kids to be able to do but the process involves parents learning it and yeah. facilitating yeah. it so it's really like a double whammy and um it's really fun yeah so maybe we could like come mm. and like do a, a a class with you and bring the nature kids love back. that yeah so that would be amazing that's awesome yeah collaborating community yes <laughs> and uh so how can at this point how can people come to your classes so I'm just offering it in Karanda. So I'm offering through the new studio that's just launched, um, Soul Temple. So it's based in Karanda. Yeah. I just finished running a Breathworth series. Um, so that was a four-week series that we just finished and that uh, we explored really similar principles about how to utilise the breath as the connection, the connection to body, then that connection to nature the exchange that happens between the respiratory system and the exchange of the trees and how we're receiving and giving like that inhale exhale but yeah only offering in person at the moment potentially could move online but um i'm i'm, I'm a busy mama so yeah <laughs> taking things slow Oh, beautiful. You already have so much going on. <laughs> and believe us, the whole online thing is, you know, there's a whole new world of technology things going on. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good in the physical. I'm good with my hands in the dirt and in person. The, the technological world is something that I'm still learning and gathering. Us too. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, these earth mamas that's just like, yeah, yeah. Why are you it, it, so much time with technology? Soil now? under the fingertips, typing away. Oh, that's still happening. Dirty yeah. ones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> typing with dirty nail fingers. <laughs> All right, uh, what's the next question? Uh, yeah, we've moved into that a little bit, but can you can you tell us why? Why you do what you do? Mm. So why I do what I do, so that's a really big question for me. Um, and when when I think about this question, it really evokes kind of my journey in life and kind of how I developed the person that I am and who I am. And I don't know if I set out intentionally to do each of the practices and each of the offerings that I've come to in this point. It's been a slow development different things and opportunities arise and then you resonate with that and then something else gets uh, activated and then you're able to come into a deeper connection um, within within all these different offerings. And it, it's, it's more something that um, has slowly just built upon itself. 
but I've always had a connection to nature. If I was to ever ask myself, even from a really young age, what is the one thing that I know about myself? It was always the answer that I could feel nature easily. And this was the first response of myself. Like I would often be exploring who I am, what it is that I am. And that was always my number one thing that I was like, I can feel nature easily. I can understand the sensational experiences of nature through beauty, through enjoyment, through understanding what it is to be connected mm -hmm. and then kind of taking that love and that passion and that self-identification and bringing it out into the world. So it, it's it's my passions that are laid out. So my, my three job bases and then even my lifestyle, I live off grid in the rainforest. Um, I am homesteading a lot of my life around the garden and these principles that I'm applying to my life it's just a natural passion that just falls out of me and I couldn't imagine life any differently like harvesting natural beautiful energy that's so vital and alive and filling up your cells and filling up the your body it it, it, it completes me it gives me a sense of belonging it gives me a sense of true satisfaction in the way that I live this life and to be able to offer that because the, you you walk around and you see so many people in society and that they're, they're looking for something and I really believe that that longing that we're looking for is just that connection to nature that's where I found that place my my place in the world and so if I can know this from a grounded space and then take it into all the offerings that I do to take it into my days at work when I'm working with small world journeys, when we're going out, doing doing all the educational principles that we do, which the days are really complicated there. You can take that love and whatever situation you're in, you can invigorate people with that passion. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, yeah, I, I can't not live this life. I'm too passionate inside my own being. It, it's too alive. It would suffocate me <laughs> if I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get it out to the world. So, yeah. 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 So beautiful. Wonderful. Thank and, you. And did you, like what I hear there is you're deeply connected and that it started from a very young age and your, yeah. I guess, the questioning and your spirituality of, you know, what's your purpose and why you're here and who you are was really reflected back to you from nature. So I wonder, as you were growing up, like what kind of childhood did you have and like where did you, uh, what was your natural space like? Where did you lean into you? Were you, have you always been in the rainforest? Were you on the ocean? Are you a bush kid? Yeah. So my, I, I, my first original memories um, is actually where I was growing up for. Um, and this, this memory is so implemented in my cellular function of I would walk out and I would pick all the flowers from the garden and then I would put them in the bath with me and I remember absorbing the energy of the flowers, of the petals into my body and it was like this real... A warming sensation of knowing how to bring that energy in but my whole life at my my family my um my family grew up on the land they've always worked on the land I come from fourth generation of farmers right. um so my great my grandfather and my great grandfather and my great great grandfather and we still have our homestead we still have the traditional farm the farm's sold but the homestead's still in the family so this is a century old homestead wow. um yeah so really lucky to experience that I just got my Beautiful rifle bird here. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> He's flown off. Um, but that that I think that influence of it passing down through the generations. And I was really lucky to grow up on the farm. Like I remember my grandfather taking me out the back. Um, and we the first time that I saw an animal be killed my grandfather is my hero and I witnessed him with uh, 
showing me how to take an animal's life with gratitude, with awareness. And we killed this chicken for the um, Christmas roast, but it was just a way of living. Like we'd go and we'd milk the cows in the morning and get the milk from the dairy farm and bring it up and put it onto our cereals. And this, this obviously dramatically influenced my mom and my whole life we were connected to different states of nature but it wasn't until uh my mum and i and my stepdad and my brother we moved to serena oh yeah and why mum my mum started um building a sustainable property um and i really witnessed the way that uh, my mum was going through some health difficulties and she wasn't doing the best before she started her gardening practices. And I really witnessed firsthand as a daughter-mother connection the changes that happened in my mum as she became more connected to the garden, as she became more passionate about the garden. So I was about 15 years old at this point. And watching my mum transform within herself just was like I'd already had this connection, like I grew up exploring nature. When when my son asked me what I did as a child, we used to just pack our backpacks full of, we had like some compasses and maps and just pretend things and we'd just walk off for the day exploring the land, walking. Mm. I thought it was for miles away, but my mum would tell me I was just down the road and she could still <laughs> see me from the balcony, but it felt like a, a whole nother world away to me. Yeah. But really seeing my mum transform through her garden, it, it it was that ability to be able to experience it in myself, in, in mm. witnessing the power of nature. And my mum's property became phenomenal. She had one of the um, most exotic and rarest gardens in Australia for sustainability, had what some of the most amounts of fruit um, and nut trees. <laughs> Just playing with Riley. Um, and so that, that was a big, big influence for me, but yes, always, always like we had horses and always on the land, always learning how to live with the land from the land. And then in my later years, um, when I started to kind of question that spirituality, when I started to really explore my individuality away from the home base, my initial connection was always uh, nature. I, I used to walk. I used to, I, I remember when I was about 19, I would wake up every day and I would put my feet first thing on the earth and I would say good morning to the earth and give that gratitude and give that state of being. And then for days, I often just walked and explored the lands and just would carry this kind of connection, communication to what was around me to the natural settings and um, it's just developed from there and now I'm at a place where I'm comfortably confident with what I have to offer with the way that I've built this for myself. Mm. Now living in the rainforest, the rainforest is a whole nother world in itself. So living self-sufficiently as much as we can off-grid um, in the rainforest comes with so many challenges mm -hmm. so much beauty yeah um it, it has the extremities of of both um but i am confident and capable woman from the challenges that have arisen from this lifestyle so mm -hmm. yeah very beneficial but yeah, yeah hard work <laughs> yeah mm. amazing Oh, do, you, do you have anything you want to add to that before I jump in? No, no, you can go. Go. <laughs> um, you you are a picture of health, and it looks like um, you know, like that's such beautiful formative uh, way to grow up and to experience. And I know, like, I had aspects of you know being in nature as a child, but for me, it was more of uh, therapy and release and somewhere to escape to because my family life was a little bit challenging and, you know, not growing food exactly, but learning little bits and pieces from my grandparents when I spent time with them. But your examples and what you share really show, you know, like the person that you've become and your offerings to the world is such a, um, it's such a gift. And, when we look at children these days, yeah, of course, when we look at children these days, 
who are stuck in front of a screen and it's such a technological world where they're really missing out on these key opportunities to pick flowers and bathe with them and go for these mad adventures just around the corner that their parents can see. All of these, um, you know, making cubbies in the forest or whatever it is, that deep nature connection. Like what my question is like where, what, what are our children going to be growing into if they don't have that beautiful exposure to nature that you had and that we've had to being so reliant on technology and so with your work work you know with children and education yeah. are you working with mainstream schools like yeah I am yeah so I work with um secondary students often really uh private schools from big cities so children that are uh, so ages between about 13 to 17, um, that's my general age group. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, it is, it's extremely interesting. Like um, I, I, <laughs> the wrong <I'm> witnessing, <laughs> I'm witnessing the way that um, these children's bodies are operating within nature. So I, I take them out and we'll do, um, days long camping out at different camp spots across the wet tropics and we're hiking up mountains, we're walking up rivers, we're, we're exploring the bases of nature. And I'm witnessing it not just on a psychological level, the, these children, but on their physical level. Like I, I will walk through the creek and we're walking up the creek and I'll often see children that haven't had much connection to nature stand on a rock that's pointy like this and put their foot flat. And I have to teach them at 14, 15 years old how to wrap their foot around a rock because their exposure to that muscle memory, that exposure to their bodies developing the understanding of how to walk in these constructs that aren't man-made, that aren't flat, and it's it's physiologically affecting their bodies in a really unfortunate way. And within my studies, within movement and learning to rewild our bodies, I know that um, sixty percent of our brain is donated to movement. So they've actually done studies on children that the more that they are exposed to these different movements, the more that they're out in nature, the more that they can expand their capabilities of movements, they actually have a higher IQ. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's in so many exposures to nature. It's not just the movement. There's the the increase of uh, the sun exposure there's the mm -hmm. increase of the pheromones the the smells that are around them the connection the touches the sensory the sensory stimulation through their hands it's it's all interconnected and it it affects every part of their being and even on that spiritual level as toddy was saying i I, as a mum, it, it, it's something that I'm exploring within myself. My my own son is exploring these worlds between mm -hmm. what is technological and what is more nature based lifestyles. Um, so we would we just dropped out, but um, what I was discussing is kind of what I see when I like. The majority of my students um, do, they, they come from city bases, they come from Melbourne, the majority, um, or Sydney. But the, these students I'm really witnessing, like from my own son, um, he, he's had quite a natural upbringing. When I walk up a mountain, um, he can scamper up these mountains. And when I'm taking these 14, 15-year-olds up a mountain, I can... I, <laughs> their ability to be able to process these situations within the brain like the you you need to be quite fast thinking in certain situations especially there's um complicated parts of the hike where you really need to access that intelligence of the body you need to be quick thinking and which i see my son being able to do and quite capable when i take him i, I often just let him go but with these students i'm i'm nursing them as if they're four or five year olds that are learning how to use these skills for the first time i'm having to assist them and educate them on basic functions that um, you think that come naturally to us as humans, but witnessing it through the experiences of my job and my lifestyle, it, it isn't. These, these kids 
don't have this capability and especially coming out of COVID mm. when um because a lot of my students came from Melbourne and so they were in lockdown for this high period of time and they weren't getting that exposure to the sun and it had a effect on them in so many ways that I've only just started to see them kind of coming full circle at the end of last year when the um, borders were lifted and the restrictions were lifted and they were capable of doing things. But seeing them homebound, it, it stunted their growth. And these 14, 15-year-olds that you think that would have these certain skill sets, have these certain mindsets, they just hadn't developed it yet because they didn't have that exposure to life. They didn't. They weren't outside. They were just getting so much stimulation through the technology. So I, it's it's a massive question, Toddy, about how I think that this generation will uh, go being so exposed to technology and so limited to the natural world. And it, it goes into so many different aspects that um, we, we think about and we explore both through my personal life and through my careers because where, where I work with a lot of um, people that are working within climate change and kind of taking children and offering them the opportunity to understand what's coming mm. and it's it's not about um instilling fear mm. it's about preparation for the next generation to understand that this world is changing mm. and it's changing at an unprecedented rate that we're trying to be able to one, have the animals and have the plants evolve at a state that are supportive to uh, life here on this planet, but two, the capability of the consciousness through the generations for them to grasp what is to come for them mm -hmm. because they're, they're not exposed to the changes within nature. Like they, they, they don't understand the differing world that is going to be happening around them. But for a lot of people that spend their time in nature, they, they're seeing things are already starting to change. They're already witnessing that the world is moving slowly and it's just going to move faster and faster. And a big part of my practice in our family is teaching my son these skill sets. So teaching him um, the traditional ways of living off the land, of living how to support yourself. We've just bought a mill and to create our own timber. So we're expanding out and doing renovations and we're, we're these trees that are falling in the rainforest, we're collecting them to cut and create our own timber. We're learning how to create these lifestyles, how to build everything at home. Because as we experienced through COVID, when we're depending, Dependent upon systems, as soon as those systems have the smallest bit of glitch in them, our dependency and our survival gets really threatened. Mm -hmm. But when you're in tune with nature and you're learning how to live alongside these changes, with it, you you develop with it slowly, and it, it's kind of teaching kids how to approach what is to come for them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's a big part of what we do at home here with my son and at work as well so yeah yeah I'm very lucky yeah. <laughs> and it's really um it's really good to know because we work with ages 4 to 12 mm. and you, yes. you work th yeah. 13 to 17. 13 to 17 so yeah. that's so great we can really channel the energy that way and we're that's the same for us it's like staying away from the fear and really in, embodying and learning about uh solutions based thinking and yeah cultivating that understanding of whole systems from that young age mm. but in order to do that it's been it's got to be facilitated by the parents to communicate that to our age group and so it's a whole family whole systems approach so that yeah, yeah when you've got these teenagers going into the the wild rewilding you know their level of um of what they can receive is not stuck with coordination it's like they're deepening into that therapy um you know like there's just layers each time mm. you can go into into nature Absolutely. and what you can receive or just one hike and what you can learn if you're just worried about surviving <laughs> then there's no you know what's the opportunity to to thrive sure. when it's mm. like yeah your whole you're in fight and flight because you feel unsafe in nature so 
really beautiful work that you're doing yes. there. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Let's jump into the next question. <laughs> My turn. Um, you've already touched on it so many times. I've heard through everything you're sharing with us, but the module that we're in at the moment with our program is the permaculture principle catch and store energy. Could you share mm-hmm. with us a, a way that you use that principle in your life? I just heard about the mill and the falling trees. Like there's a beautiful example right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it, th- this question like kind of invigorates both aspects um, of my personal and um, work life. It's it's really um, in the home base within that homesteading lifestyle. You observing the garden. You're you're watching what's coming into fruition, and then you're learning how to harvest and store that energy. So a lot of part of homesteading is just the practice of. Um, being able to preserve. So however you do this preservation of these energies, this food that's coming through, you're, you just develop it as you go. Like um, you are you just come into new recipes, you come into new ways, you offer this from the garden and it's like this communication, okay, this is what's coming in now when we learn how to be able to preserve that and to treasure and nurture that so that it, it, it that life is being um celebrated and i i hate seeing food wasted from my garden or anything so it's really being able to utilize every opportunity within um observing and interacting and then through my work which um eco yoga is really based upon so this is the basic principle that i really utilize within eco yoga is teaching about the biophysics so this is something that I first was exposed to about four years ago. Um, biophysics, the words, quite new to me, but it, it, it's something that I started it to explore um, in understanding how the therapeutics go deeper on a cellular level, on the physics level of our body when we go into nature. What's actually happening within our body, and this is what I'm using in my teaching. So. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have heard the uh, term forest bathing. Yeah, so it, it's a therapeutic practice of kind of understanding how nature's impacting us on the physical um, levels of our biology. But take taking that and just going a little bit further and really understanding. So when you're like walking into a forest, understanding what's happening on that biological response of your body, understanding how your microbiome microbiome is responding to the microbiome within the forest how that cell soil is being able to generate through our body through our feet coming and receiving how the the uh release from the trees and the chemicals that are released and the aromas that are released from the trees how we breathe them in and they have functions on us they they change our mood they change our serotonin level it it has these contributing factors the sun is an amazing (laughs) phenomenal harvest of energy so it, it it's a way of us being able to store this cellular energy that We're really exploring at the forefront of um, science right now. We're really, as a collective of humans, really understanding that we don't just receive energy from the food that we eat or the air that we breathe or the water that we drink. We're really receiving this full body nourishment from nature and it's this continual cyclic exchange where we give and we receive and kind of this uh, this a uh, way of taking and storing that energy is what I practice to teach my students and it's about kind of slowing your body down going going to that somatic experience going into that cellular experience and that sensations to remove the blockages so within yoga and within a lot of spiritual teachings they believe that we have these blockages in our systems, whether it's an emotional blockage or a physical blockage, they become one of the same when it's working on the energetic level. Right. And so through the practice of yoga or whatever it is that's your practice, by removing these energy blockages in Chinese, they're the meridians, in yogic, it's the nadis. Mm-hmm. And through clearing these energy channels, we're able to receive more prana. So we go into the practice of removing these toxicities these emotional states from the body so that we can take this prana in so that we when we sit in nature Mm. we observe nature we experience nature 
and the subtleties in our mind also becomes more aware. So it's it's that harvesting of energy, so removing and detoxifying the blockages and then bringing the mind into a stillness so that we can experience these subtleties of how we're being affected, um, how the cellular function is being affected. So you're, you're more aware of it when you're sitting within the forest and you're, you're feeling these things. You're feeling the way that the, the soil's feeding your microbiome. It's like little bubbles under your feet or you're feeling the sun fall on your body and it's warming you up and your cells are taking in that life force. It's, it's, it becomes a fusion of both the scientific understanding of biophysics, biology, the biological response of nature, and that somatic installing of our body on the cellular level of understanding. And yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 that's why I love yoga because it, it, it allows for us to incorporate it on such a deep level of who we are mm. so that's one way that i practice the um store and collect of energy in, yeah. in my yeah. <laughs> full bodied yeah full, yeah. full body nature yeah and then <laughs> teaching that to others it's amazing um, yeah yeah i had a really cool experience one of my favorite experiences with my students um, this was a very elite private school, um, a, a private girl, all girls private school. And we went into the forest and we began this walk and it, it, it was talking about how our body's responding and how these ions are being received, these negative ions, and would walk through the forest and would speak about the breath and how we're in the exchange with the trees as we exhale our carbon we receive the oxygen and they take the carbon and as we're getting closer to the waterfall speaking about this charge that's happening mm -hmm. on the cellular function from the ions that we're receiving from that water and then I have two bottles of water with me I had town water and then I had um, filtered spring water and I gave them the opportunity to taste both of these things while they're sitting receiving the ions of the waterfall and to taste the difference between what it is that's town water and how it feels and wh what is what does the body feel like what's the response to that and then tasting that spring water and the response was just so beautiful these girls just fell in love like it gave them the opportunity to, through the mind and through the sensations, connecting to nature, to be able to experience it in such a way that it didn't become like, okay, so this is an education about a tree and it kind of becomes this external environmental way of learning about the forest. It becomes I am the ecology. I am a part of this system. It is impacting me. And the, the response from them, like I had one girl that cried and just like was just like this is this has changed my way that I see the world because it gave her a place in the world. So mm. it's really powerful. It is really powerful. Really so powerful. much so. And yeah. and not just you should drink pure water, stay away from tap water. Mm. It's like they get to make that decision based on the experience. So such a beautiful thing to facilitate. Yeah, sounds amazing. When's our turn? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could. Yeah, well, we, you could we got the something. water lesson already. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Water's amazing. I've been learning a yeah. lot about water. It's an incredible so, um, substance. Ashaya, what what um what advice could you give our nature kids community on being earth carers? Uh, so I s sat with this question. So this is this is a big question to me um, because passing on to your children, like uh, the, when, when you become a parent and when you become um, yes. older in your age, you really recognise the passing down of the generation. And so I think that after everything, after learning how to live an environmentally sustainable lifestyle, after learning how to be earth carers of of how to, to support your way in this world that has a positive impact. Behind it all is the soul and the spirit. Mm -hmm. And to fall in love with nature mm -hmm. for me is where the soul and the spirit fills up from life. Mm -hmm. And so from this state, that most core state of being and existing here on this planet, fall in love with nature. Like let yourself 
fall in love. So when you wake up and you step out onto the earth, feel the way that the earth feels beneath your feet. When the sun falls onto you, feel the way that the sun feels or when you pick herbs and you put them in your tea, fall in love. Like it becomes a communication and every time that you interact with nature, it just deepens that communication. It deepens that connection and that relationship and your whole being gets filled up. You, you, you find a place within this world and when you offer that to your children, it becomes a fulfillment of life. And at the end of the day, utilizing this one precious life in a way that we can feel that we can pass on and we know that we lived life as much as we could. I think really to me is the one thing that I could pass is um, the thing that I would want to teach parents to pass on to their children, fall in love for yourself. And then, and then from that place and that true integrity, that true place of authentic love, it just emanates from you. It, it's no longer a state of mind about teaching mm. about different practices. It, it becomes a, a breath and the way that you live and your children embody this. They see it. They feel it. They feel the emanation. They feel your happiness. They feel your fulfillment in life. And then that gives them a guide on how to utilize their life to find fulfillment. Mm, beautiful yeah. <laughs> and like powerful. you said as, as a young person your experience of seeing mm -hmm. your mum with her health problems to how yeah. she was after growing the garden you know we're role modeling and we're only going to care for things that we love and that we appreciate and have yeah. for easily yeah. with with ease yeah 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 that's that's been a big the big journey of that that's that's where that drive comes from it's like you you love these people around you and you care for them on a human level of these relationships that you build and you want to support them but when you build that relationship with nature it's like every aspect of my life whether I, I I'm a wildlife carer and I care for a lot of animals it you take this love in and it just becomes a state of being and that drive to save and protect it, it, it it's like that's your best friend mm -hmm. you don't want to see it get hurt you don't you don't want to see it be abused or or to be destroyed it's like it, it invigorates you to protect and to be earth carers from a state of true love yeah oh, yeah <laughs> that's so beautiful that's beautiful thank you yeah. mm. Well, just to, just to wrap it up, we've got one last question for you. Can you yeah. share with us? Can you share with us what you love about nature? It is the internal landscapes of how I exist. Mm. So my entire being is filled with every aspect of nature, whether it's the health that I receive from the plants, or whether it's the health that I receive. From the forest or the state of all and connection it, it, it it's who I am ultimately on every level it's who we all are on every level so that sense of belonging but within this question I really wanted to explore something that um I've shared in the way that I kind of express the indigenous connection to land because for me this is one of the most shaping forms that I've been shown to me. It, it's changed who I am. It's changed the way that I approach the world. And so when I offer this to people of what country means to the Indigenous and with permission that I've been given to share this with um, the knowledge that I've been shared, this isn't my culture, but I acknowledge all the cultures that have given me permission to share um, up here in the wet tropics. When you're exploring this connection to country it's a way of seeing yourself you're seeing yourself standing on this mountain and as you're standing on the mountain you're looking out on your country and you're seeing this land in front of you and you're seeing the valleys and the way that the valleys are shaped and what it is this land 
and you know this country, you know this place, it's it's a part of who you are, it's a part of your stories, it's a part of your dance, it's a part of your culture, the, the land becomes you. And when you look out, you know that this landscape is formed through this dreaming, through this story, and you know that this part of that country and this land is where the ancestors are born. And then you scan out and you look out from the mountain and you see another landscape of its dreaming and you know that this is where the lamandra are and when the lamandra are flowering, you know that the fish are blooming, you know that they're, they're ready and juicy to eat and you know what then when they're ready to juicy to eat that it also means that this part of country is the Davidson plums are ready to be eaten and it becomes this conversation with the land. It becomes a map of how you exist. You, you know where your babies are born you know where when a woman falls pregnant and when a woman realizes she's conceived and she's holding a child that becomes a spiritual point for that child at that point and they believe that's where the spirit returns to after they pass on and they go back to the dreaming this is their spirit point and that's where they can speak to this ancestor and so the whole land around them becomes this map and this map is their survival. This map is their connection. It, it, it's a part of the complete function of family, ancestors, dreaming. And the dreaming is the building of what land represents, what, what country represents. And so when I explain this to people of what country is for me i i obviously am not indigenous but i can understand that interconnection from all aspects of how country affects who we are how land affects who we are and so that embodiment that i've received from the indigenous that kind of instills in my practice in the way that i connect to the earth in my practice of Feeling, feeling the land, understanding it as a map, understanding it as country. I think that that has impacted me more than anything. And that connection that I carry is probably the most fundamental thing. And that's what I love most about nature is to explore in all these ways that we can move deeper into understanding and connecting within nature. Wow. It's, a, it's a big question that Wonderful. I Oh. Yeah, yeah, really um, beautifully articulated, mm. and I, I'm not indigenous either, but I can really feel that and relate to it. And um, permaculture for me, when I started that journey, really gave me that language and understanding of what you talk about and what indigenous cultures talk about in terms of caring for country. And to see all of those connections and re its relationships. Yeah. Timing yeah. relationships and the reading of the landscape. Um, yeah, it activated my cells. And even though it's called permaculture as in the perm permanence and agriculture, it's really based on ancient knowledge and, and an understanding of how to, um, how to read landscapes. And, and in, in saying that, people could come along to land and implement a permaculture um, design and produce food and all of, you know, and have the swales and all of the elements and have a permaculture property. But if that was installed by somebody else and those people weren't actually embodying the principles of permaculture and understanding why yeah. things are placed in the way that they are, then that connection and that understanding to the relationships that you speak of is completely missed. So it really yeah. comes back to living it mm. and connecting and seeing all of those relationships. And that can only happen through time and connection. You can't just read a book and go, oh, okay, yeah. I understand it now. It's like, you know, we're so in in a way we're kind of far behind because we don't have those. If we're not indigenous and we haven't been passed on these stories and this knowledge, and we're beginning from scratch and just like in my journey of like, aha, okay, 
I see from my limited perspective, I have a, uh, yeah. a grasp of that understanding and I want more. And yes, there's, it weaves back into my ancestry. And I know this, this is a remembering, but it's still, it's still not my country. When I go and walk up onto the, you know, the hike, I can, I know. I can see and read the landscape, but I don't have the stories. The dreaming is something that, you know, it's like a, there's so much more learning to to um, receive through um, through the ways of Indigenous culture yeah. to really be welcomed in and belong to the land. Um, so doing the best part uh, in, in our own home gardens mm-hmm. and and making those connections with the people who are willing to share is pretty special. But it's yeah, thank you for really offering that perspective. And and how did you, you know, like how have you been able to cultivate that um, those learnings from Indigenous cultures along the way? So I've always had a massive um, respect and a massive interest within uh, Indigenous culture that you start to learn anything in the aspect of um, the connection of land about those relationships that you recognise. You just start to go in deeper and the layers start to unfold in front of you and you learn from your grandparents who learnt off the land and then you go further back and you learn from their ancestors, your own ancestors, and then within this landscape, within the country that we live on, Jabagai country, uh, bordering onto Bulwai, uh, you you start to go further back and back and back and you start to understand the difference of the way that people connected to nature. And for me, the Indigenous culture's always been a massive part of um, how to respect the land and learning just like a couple of words in Jabagai, um, the country I live on, is a way of me respecting the things that are around me by, by calling them by their true name, by what they've been called for 60,000 years. It, it, it makes the ancestors in this land happy. It makes that plant happy. It was the first time human consciousness gave this a name that said that this is pulled it almost from the dreaming and named it and said this is your name within this reality in this country on Jabagai, the language that I've learned but it, it's just been through exposure like yesterday I just um sat with a beautiful human Eli from the Gulf who um, came down and I just met him on a bush tucker um, page online and then I was just like you want to talk bush tucker I want to talk bush tucker bush tucker is a big part of my life and my learnings and my teachings and so we just went for a walk and it was the first time I'd taken him off um, he, the first time that he's been taken into the rainforest he's a saltwater country boy and we just sat and he just explained to me country and up, up in the gulf um in north queensland far north queensland the the practices and traditions are still very alive and that it comes with all of what is involved in black man law as he said it um and so there's white man law and then there's black man law and so that they're, they're still very much living within those teachings and within those connections but it was just it's just you through pure curiosity, a lot, a lot of my friendships, I, I share a lot of beautiful friendships with the Indigenous. Um, they're, they're really just I, I, beautiful humans that we just want to talk about the earth and we want to share our culture. Um, they, they want to share their culture with me. So th- there's a pride, there's a sense of um, excitement that somebody's asking these questions. And I, I often get asked by the teachers how do I not offend the indigenous and I just I these are my teachers that work on the private schools um, when we're going out and we're doing indigenous immersion programs and I'm, I'm just like just have a genuine curiosity and culture like that that's why these people are wanting to share it's why they're here that's why they're wanting to teach is because they have this wealth of knowledge this this understanding that as Toddy said as um a European-based background in the Indigenous country. We don't know the stories like they know it. They lived and breathed 
their dreaming. It was who they were on every aspect of their being. And so their, their way of being able to explore and expand and express the land is in ways that we would never really understand. So just go out into your community and find people that want to share, find, find Indigenous that are speaking and the information that they hold is keeping culture alive it, it's it's keeping the dreaming the dreaming's always dreaming it's it, it's it is a part of us it's ever flowing by by them sharing it allows for these elders it allows for the next generation to have a place and to be able to pass this knowledge on so just reach out just find in community and it's it's happening all over australia there's a massive celebration of the indigenous uh eco tourism is becoming a big part it's it's keeping um their social ability and the economic ability for them to be able to create sustainability within their communities but just curiosity just explore and expand and connect Yay, thank you for sharing that. Really potent, really beautiful. Anything you want to add, Sammy? Um, not really. I knew this this was going to be an amazing interview. I was so excited to learn so much more about, you know, all your offerings. I, I definitely follow you on social media and I love learning and watching everything that you do. So thank you so much for sharing today. Yay. Thank so you. We're going to say goodbye to everybody. Anything you want to add before we sign out today, Ashea? Um, just thank you. Thank you. It, it might seem like small measures to go out into the garden and to pick your plants with your children, but you're really reshaping the generations. And it's by offering children these many different forms of learning is how we expand society. It's, it's in the capabilities that we expand the mindset and that's how we expand society and that's the development of our future so while it's just the nurturing of you as a parent with your child you really are making a difference in these small ways and so deeply grateful yay beautiful thank you so you go out and cultivate some curiosity and connect to nature and and the amazing culture of people and do some eco yoga. <laughs> some eco yoga. Come, come live in Karanda with us and live in the wet tropics. <laughs> Connect to nature and live from the land. <laughs> and have rifle birds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cup of wildlife, Kara. All yeah. right. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a beautiful you. day. Bye. <laughs>